Today I'm going to be talking about Eurolift. Uh, I've been doing Eurolift since 2014, so I've had a good chance to see the progression of it over the last few years. Um, and you see the talk is titled Back to Basics, and we'll get to that in just a moment. These are my disclosures. Um, in 2024, we have more options for treating BPH than we've ever had, including a number of great missed procedures. Um, we just went over a couple of, of the great ones that we're seeing now, and uh, there'll be a couple more to be presented. But Eurolift was really the first of the missed procedures to come along on the market. Um, there's been over 500,000 procedures performed. And it's it's uh, depending on what uh, sources you look at, it's between 25 and 35% of the surgical intervention market right now in BPH. So why would you want to do it? Um, number one, it can be performed quickly. Uh, a lot of procedures, as everyone knows, are performed under local anesthesia these days. I actually prefer to do them under IV sedation, and I'll get into why in a moment. Um, it's also the only procedure that you can do that's actually indicated for under 30 grams. All the other myths that we're talking about are typically between 30 and 80 grams. And unfortunately, we see a lot of patients that are smaller sized prostates that can be quite difficult in terms of how we manage them from a minimally invasive standpoint. Um, obviously, lack of cutting or, or any type of intervention directly to the tissue uh, from an energy standpoint leads to uh, less intraoperative bleeding. For my Eurolifts, I don't stop any anticoagulation unless they have a uh, relenta for a very fresh stent, so it's very rare that I would do a case without um, leaving them on their anticoagulation. Um, the other thing that I like about the Eurolift is that you can really sculpt the channel. So not every patient is created equal. You have to create a channel based on their specific anatomy and the ability to place implants in specific locations and numbers really gives us uh, some flexibility in how we attack the prostate. Um, also, uh, I think in Canada, there's a lot more catheter use because we uh, typically, I, I just saw on Kevin's slide, uh, the Eurolift uh, data that he had for catheter placement is about 36%. And ours is typically in the neighborhood of 10%. The data says anywhere between 10 and 20. So the idea to not have a catheter in place and avoid irritating voiding, uh, voiding symptoms is, is a very preferred option for patients. When you talk about uh, adverse events, there's very minimal ones. Uh, everybody's familiar with the normal irritative symptoms, dysuria that we get, but no erectile dysfunction, no ejaculatory dysfunction, no leaking. Um, and we'll talk about stones in a minute because I think that's a, a more a function of, of the technique than it is of the therapy itself. There's also low dropout rates for Eurolift. Uh, five, at five years, it's 8.6%. So th this is a compelling procedure to look at. Here's just a, a brief look. Uh, uh, comparing uh, Resume and Eurolift head-to-head. -head. Um, they both have about the same IPSS reduction. Uh, it's obviously better than medicine. Uh, in the flow rate, the uh, water vapor treatment tends to be a little bit better. Um, but what I want to focus on and why the, the talk is called Back to Basics is really this 13.6% retreatment rate at five years. This was initially from a paper uh, in 2017. And then subsequently, Steve Kaplan published a paper a couple of years ago that looked at the retreatment rates, specifically for MIS, but also comparing to, to TURP and other more invasive procedures. And surprisingly, we found that the retreatment rates, which we expect to be 1% or 2% each year, uh, are much higher, so up to 6% for all of the therapies. So we were all surprised that the, the numbers were higher. And I kind of thought about um, why our retreatment rates were low uh, initially with Eurolift, and then they sort of became, and they became gr grouped in much more uh, in similar fashion to the other treatments in that paper. So we're going to talk about, you know, pearls for how we avoid uh, retreatment. First of all, uh, after 500,000 plus patients done, you can treat all different sizes and shapes of prostates. You can treat uh, median lobes, you can treat larger prostates. But what we know, and many of the people on the panel along with me uh, have performed these procedures, is that the patients who have the smaller, more typical anatomy tend to do the best with this procedure, um, especially in terms of length of durability. 
And it's interesting that we just had the talk about what we do for our preoperative workup. I think the biggest thing you can get fooled by when you're doing a Eurolift is not knowing if there's a middle lobe or not. Some patients, if they're not getting flexible cystoscopy before and they're just going straight to the procedure, you get fooled and you end up having to put more implants than you want. Um, so I always do a preoperative flexible cystoscopy and I also usually do a truss. Uh, the purpose of that is you want to really know the uh, distance between the, the capsule of the prostate and the urethra so that you know that the implants will get out far enough to have a good compression effect. Um, but I just think knowing the anatomy of the prostate before you're going in to do your procedure, whether it's Eurolift or otherwise, is becoming more and more important to match the procedure to the best uh, outcome. As I mentioned before, I'm gonna show a short video in a minute of, of how we would do one of these, but the, the idea of sculpting is really important. We're trying to make the anterior portion of the channel open. We don't have to create a terp defect, and I think that's where a lot of people get into trouble. They either say, oh, I'll use three implants, which never works, or they try to go from six implants to eight or nine or 10, because they're constantly trying to open up the prostate, and we'll show that in a minute. Um, my personal choice is to use at least six implants with every patient. I think that really increases the durability. And uh, any implants that you place near the bladder neck, which was something that we did early on, uh, often can lead to a capsular tab migration and then stone formation. So if there's any knock on Eurolift uh, 10 years out after uh, it's uh, uh, brought, uh, since it's been brought into uh, widespread use, it's that you form stones in the bladder and then you have to go back in, take those stones out, take those clips out. If you avoid uh, coming close to the bladder neck, you, you basically don't have that problem. Um, the other thing is you don't want to be placing implants posteriorly. That's where your uh, neurovascular bundles are at the four and eight o'clock position and then just nothing near the rectum. And finally, uh, there's a, a big part of this, and Kevin brought it up, is the idea of managing expectations. So initially, we tried to compare Eurolift to, uh, to TERP, and obviously we had to do that to show efficacy. But really, the important part of this procedure is to get people an option that doesn't require uh, a lot of intervention in terms of uh, long recovery and also protects their sexual function, their, their continence, and it could last for a year or two, it could last for six or seven years, and I think we've, we've sort of morphed a little bit into the idea of the bridging procedures where we know with all these different procedures that we have available to us that I showed in my initial slide that someone who has a Eurolift may eventually graduate to a more invasive procedure. Um, so here's an example of a patient, even though I'm kind of encouraging people to do simpler ones. This is a patient with a high median bar that I thought would be good to show. Um, basically has an IPSS score of 19, um, was on tamsulosin, but also had another, a number of other medications and didn't want to continue to take meds. Um, the prostate was pretty small, only 31.1 uh, cc's, and he had a pretty poor Qmax uh, on his Eurocuff. And when we did a cystoscopy, we saw that his bladder neck was quite high. So how do we handle something like this? And here you're gonna, we're gonna jump right into it. Um, the tissue at the top, uh, you can see there's, there's some overhanging tissue, but no median lobe. Uh, and six implants are gonna be placed for this procedure. This is done under IV sedation. And I like that so that the patient doesn't move. E everyone who's done a Eurolift uh, in the office knows that they can be done, but the problem is that they are often quite uncomfortable for the patient and they move. If you're gonna deal with more difficult anatomy, you wanna have uh, every advantage that you can and the patient not moving is a huge one. Usually if the patient's moving as well, you get more uh, bleeding. So here, if you notice where the implants are going, they're more, uh, th th this is called a stack procedure, so we're stacking implants along the lateral aspects of the prostate, but higher up in the, uh, here it's at the 10 o'clock position. We're not really putting any implants uh, at the posterior aspect of the, of the channel because we, we want to avoid those critical structures. And as we progress through this, 
you're going to see that this anterior channel opens. And just like the original sort of pre pre uh, premise of doing Urolift was, it was that a, a urinary catheter travels along the anterior aspect of the urethra. And here you see a nice wide open anterior channel after six implants. And you'll see at the end here uh, just a before and after to show how much that tissue was hanging down. So that's what it looked like on the left before and, and then after a nice wide channel. Thank you very much. And uh, before I leave the stage, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Kim and Dr. Flynn for organizing a, a great first meeting. Congratulations.